end up ahead of my first class. Um, Dream of Root. So hopefully you've read it. 130 lines? 150. 156. Dream of the Root. Uh, I'll try to make sense of all this stuff uh, as we go through the poem. So this to begin with. It's preserved in the Vercelli manuscript in Vercelli, Italy. You've got a little introduction. I've talked about some of this. Okay. Um, it's got a bunch of homiletic material in it, a bunch of homilies. It also has three other poems, Andreas, Fates of the Apostles, and Elena. Okay? Uh, this is the longest poem in the manuscript. Fates of the Apostles and Elena are both by one of the 12, uh, I can never think how to put this, 12 known, named poets of the Anglo-Saxon period. Um, a guy named Kenilworth, and the reason we know that these two are by him, and there's two others that we know by him, the reason we know they're by him is because he signs his name in the poem in an acrostic. You can look at the manuscript and see C-Y-N-E-W-U-L-F in all four of the works that are attributed to him. Okay? Um, this is about St. Andrew. This is about the lives of the apostles. This is about St. Helena, okay, Elena. Um, very, very briefly, Helena, the mother of Constantine the Great. She was British, he was British, okay. Um, it's because of Constantine that we have that whole church state problem, as in which gets supremacy, okay. Um, Constantine's the one who legalizes Christianity, etc. We'll maybe talk about that. Elena, the poem is about St. Helena and some men with her going on an expedition, essentially, to find the cross of Christ. Okay? And according to the tradition of the church, both East and West, that is both Catholic and Orthodox branches of the church, um, she found it in the early, get my numbers right, early fourth century, just outside Jerusalem. She's told by various people, dig here, dig here, dig here, and they dig these big pits and they don't find it. And then somebody says, dig here, and they dig up three, according to tradition, they dig up, dig up three crosses. Okay. You look at one cross, it looks just like another cross. They can't tell which one's the cross of Christ and which one's, you know, etc. So the Patriarch of Jerusalem says, here's how we'll do it. I will hold up the cross. We'll do it on a sunny day so that the sun is shine, shining. And the people who go underneath the shadow of the cross will be healed if they're ill or sick or whatever. Why? Because the book of Acts talks about people coming under Peter's shadow and they're healed, etc. And that's what happens. And they go, this is it. Okay. Um, so you have two works in this manuscript where the cross of Christ is pretty important. Okay. Which kind of links them at the very least thematically, if no other way. Okay. It is also, this is totally separate from all this stuff. It's also preserved on a cross that is in southwestern Scotland, little town of Dumfries. Um, I think I linked to a link to the Wikipedia article for one of these. Now I'm totally blanking. Either the poem or the cross. I think the cross. Um, there's a website that has a bunch of pictures of it. You can go to the website for the church. I can't remember what it's called. The church that has the cross in, and, and they use it because it, it helps bring visitors, and visitors, you know, drop coins in the alms box and stuff. This, how does this look like it should be pronounced? R-U-T-H-W-E-L-L. -L. Ruth Well would make sense, right? It's not. <laughs> it's pronounced Rivel, like drivel without the D. Okay? I don't remember why, but there is a reason for that. 
Very similar to, in Shakespeare's day, there is a street named M-O-N-K-W-E-L-L. Sounds like it should be pronounced Monkwell. Shakespeare's day is pronounced Muggle Street. It's probably where J.K. Rowling gets the muggle word from. Okay? It's the only known um, source, so to speak. But that is a known pronunciation in Shakespeare's day. He lived real close to it, something like that. Um, what else about the Beatles? Like I said, it's in Vercelli, Italy. We have no idea how really it got there. There are theories, but we're not sure how it got there, the manuscript, okay? So, Dream of the Root. One other thing. Rude. What does the word mean? It's the dream of the cross, right? The dreamer has a dream where the cross of Christ speaks to him, or where the rude of Christ speaks to him. We only use this word today in this sense in two places, if we use it at all. And one of those is Holy Rood Palace, which is in Edinburgh, belongs to the crown, now King Charles, before Queen Elizabeth. It was one of the places she loved to visit, etc. Um, you can go to it, you can visit, walk all around the whole nine yards. It's a pretty cool place, been there a couple of times. Sometimes it's spelled this way, two different words, holy, rude, okay? The only other place rude shows up is in the phrase rude scream, okay? And all that means is, I shouldn't go on, why I didn't mention that in my first class, this is how I get so far off. It's referring to what in the East is called the iconostasis. Typical church, old church architecture. You have, you know, the place where everybody stands or sits, right? Anybody know what that's called? Think Gothic cathedral. Anybody ever been to one? Take a course in England, go visit a bunch of cathedrals. A bunch of cathedrals. It's called the nave, okay? It's the nave of the church. Nave like in naval, navy. Why? Because the church is a boat an ark. It takes you out of the troubled seas to, you know, promised homeland, so to speak. Okay? Well, traditionally in those churches, you know, let's say this building is the church. Let's say back here is the altar area. This is where the priests, you know, do their business. Well, between the this area, the altar or the sanctuary, and out there, the nave, there would often be a wall of sorts. Look at a picture online of a Gothic cathedral, etc. Look at you know Westminster Abbey in London. You'll see it. Or um, Cambridge, King's College Chapel. Same kind of thing. There will be this wall-like thing that will have images on it, icons. Okay. Often in the Protestant version, which did survive for a little while that would just be dominated by a big cross, okay? So it's the cross screen. It's, it's the thing that kind of blocks the vision of those out there from what's going on in here. In one sense, it kind of replaces the curtain in the Old Testament temple. The curtain between the place out there that everybody visited and in here, the Holy of Holies, where the high priest would enter once a year so that's essentially, the only other place where rude is used as a word today, if someone's referring to church architecture kind of thing, okay? So, dream of the rude. This is, where do I have the word? Sorry, got so much crammed up here. This is an example of what's called prosopopoeia. I mean, the poem is. Anybody know what prosopopoeia is? It's where an inanimate object speaks. Okay? Um, you get this a few times in Germanic literature. In the Nibelungenlied, you have a sword that speaks. Okay? Um, in Old English, 
you have a poem called the, Hus um, the Husband's Message. Okay? Sometimes it's read as a companion piece to that poem I mentioned the other day, The Wife's Lament. Well, The Husband's Message is a message seemingly spoken by a piece of wood. The guy has inscribed a message on it in runes. Okay? And it's like, he gives it to her, and the wood speaks, so to speak. Um, it's used in Greek literature. I'm trying to remember if it's Homer, and I, I'm drawing a blank. Okay? But it's an example of prospopia where an inanimate object speaks. All right? The first word, which I erased. That's that letter ash, A-E, scrunched up together. What? That's how Beowulf begins. That's how Andreas, if I remember correctly, begins. That's how this begins. There's another one or two poems that begin with that interjection. What? What does it mean? How does Eliza translate it? Listen. I've seen lo, behold, listen. There's actually an, I'm not going to call it a translation, an adaptation of Beowulf that begins, yo, y-o, <laughs> exclamation mark. How do we use something similar to this today? Anybody? Have you ever been to, you know, had a big group of people, party or something, and somebody wants to speak? A wedding, maybe, and the father of the bride has to give a toast? What? You did it. Doesn't quite, you know, work. You stand up with a goblet and you bang it with a pin or something. And, mini, you know, loud sound. People today, you know, use their phones or they have an alarm go off. What does it do? It draws your attention there. It's a means of saying, all right, everybody calm down, shut up, take your seats. If it were a theater and a place about to begin, what does the stage manager, theater manager do? Dim the lights three times. That means take your seats. What? How many of you are very or at all familiar with British culture? Anybody listen to, have watched British film or TV? I mean, you know. Not Dalton, okay. <laughs> Not uh, Downton Abbey, you know that kind of stuff. Every now and then in in British culture, you'll hear somebody say something, something, something. What? Well, the what kind of means like don't you think? Okay, it's acting similar here. What? I'm just going to use what. I will speak of the sweetest dream. What came to me in the middle of the night. Notice right there, we have a different kind of construction than we would say in modern English. Notice. The sweetest dream, what came to me in the middle of night. How many of you talk about your dreams coming to you? What does that imply in that kind of language? It comes from... Okay, maybe God. I mean, some of your, you, you go a lot to the big leap that I, you know, outside. Comes from outside, you know. Um, some of you are taking Shakespeare. Hopefully you're going to read Hamlet. How many of you have read Hamlet? Why does Hamlet say he cannot be a king of infinity bounded in a nutshell? Were it not for bad dreams. He says, I could be a king of infinity, bounded in a nutshell. Okay, think of what that image means. Infinity, which means what? In, un, finite, no boundaries, bounded in a nutshell. So you have a paradox, right? He says, I could be a king of infinity, bounded in a nutshell, were it not for bad dreams. What's his point? Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Where do the bad dreams come from? 
To Hamlet. He had no idea of the subconscious, so to speak. If he's a king of infinity, bounded in a nutshell, and he has bad dreams, those bad dreams come from outside infinity. What's outside infinity? If it's infinite, there should be nothing there. So Hamlet's going, where are the dreams coming from? That's in the to be or not to be speech, right? So, the dream comes to him. What do we usually say? I had a dream. As Bottom says, I had a dream, a wondrous vision. Methought I saw, etc., etc. The dream comes from not me. The dream isn't produced by me. It came from outside. When speech bearers slept in their rest. The old English word literally is speech bearers. What are speech bearers? Bearers, you could say, okay, let's rephrase it. What are bearers of speech? Things that speak, right? Keep going. What are things that speak? Cows, pigs, rabbits, donkeys, cats, dogs, people. So why not translate? Because it means people when men, women, children, humanity is asleep. Again, he's trying to mimic the old English. So, because what did you think when you read speech bears? Did you automatically just think men and women, humans? When speech bears slept in their rest. It seemed, and the word there is methuchta. Me, me, modern English, me. What kind of part of speech is that? Well, it's a pronoun. How do you use it? Do you use me as the subject? Me went to the store. Me hungry. Me eat. You know. You sound like a caveman if you do that. It's an object, right? Something's given to me. Something hit me. It receives the action of the verb. Me, thu, da. Supply the subject. It thought to me. Or it thoughted me. Where's the thought come from? Outside again. Okay. Then I saw a most wondrous tree raised on high, wound round with light. The brightest beams. Tree beams, right? Because beams are made of, they were then, trees. All that beacon was covered in gold. So the tree, the beam, was covered in gold. Cool. Jim stood fair at the earth corners, and there were five upon the cross beam. What corners? Earth doesn't have corners. Put out of your mind the old notion that everybody prior to Columbus thought the world was flat. They didn't. Pythagoras knew the world was round. BC, okay? Long, long time ago. That still doesn't mean there's corners. How do you, how do you make a round ball square? Okay, you could put it on a map. What else can you do? What are the cardinal directions? Cardinal points. North, east, southwest. There's your corners. So he says, Jim stood at the earth's corners. That's kind of saying north, east, southwest. And there were five upon the cross beams. Okay. Imagine, assume for a moment, we know that the tree and beam refers to a cross. Because remember, in the manuscript, it doesn't say the dream of the root at the beginning. There, there are no titles for, for old English poetry, okay? So let's just assume for a moment that we all know it's a cross. A cross usually stands how? I kind of gave it away with the verb stands. It's upright, so like this and like this. If you take those four points, 
top, bottom, two side arms as being the cardinal directions, that's looking at it this way. Where's the Earth? So the top three can't be at the Earth's corners. So the speaker's got to be seeing it another way. How do you sleep? Horizontal, lying down. So if you're lying down, let's say, assume you sleep on your back, and you open your eyes, tilt your back like that, what can you see if you tilt far enough back? Horizon, 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 horizon. What's he seeing? Across from horizon to horizon to horizon. This isn't a little cross that he sees. At least not initially. It extends across his vision. Right? So when he sees gems, there's gems at the foot of the cross. There's gems at the head of the cross where it touches the earth. There's gems over here, and there are gems over here. They may not be literal gems, however. And there's five on the crossbeam. The word that is translated for crossbeam is uh, line eight, axel, axel yespana. Yespana, like this, okay? Axel, like a car axle. What's the purpose of a car axle? What does it do? I mean, the car rides on it connects the wheels. The axle yaspana are these. Okay? They connect something. This <laughs> to this. Okay? It's the axle, the span that connects head and so why are there more gems there? Hmm. All the angels of the Lord looked on, fair through all eternity. And you've got a gloss talking about that passage. You know, he's given one translation. Here's another one. All creation, eternally fair. That's the fair through all eternity translated earlier. Beheld the Lord's angel there. Notice that's almost totally different. Because all the angels of the Lord looked on. What's the subject? All the angels of the Lord. What's the verb? Looked on. In the other translation, all creation eternally fair beheld the Lord's angel. Now the angel of the Lord is the one being watched. Like, I don't know what the subject of this sentence is. Okay. I think it's intentionally enigmatic. Because what do poets do? Do poets ever make anything clear? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no. That's why most students don't like reading poetry. When I teach intro to lit, I do poetry in at the very end. Why? Because fiction's easy. We start with fiction, and then we do drama, and then we go to poetry. And they're like, ooh, I don't like poetry. And I say, take your earbuds out. Nine out of ten times, what are you listening to? Poetry. Songs, it's poetry. Might be good, might be bad. Doesn't matter. So, that was no felon's gallows. Yes? Um, so I'm going to walk up into this point. So right now, we're just talking about the setting of the dream. He's just like establishing that for us. Yes. Okay. Think, think of from here, from the beginning to 25, 26, 27, as prologue, if you want, or preface. The poem is ultimately divided into three main sections. Okay? But one of those sections is divided into kind of three parts. The big main section, by the cross speaking, has three components to it. Past, present, future. And then the very last section overall of the poem, we come back to the dreamer speaking. So the dreamer is speaking now. Then we're going to hear the cross from most of the poem, and then we're going to come back to the dreamer. Okay? So he's just telling us what he saw in this dream. Okay? Nothing speaking yet other than the dreamer. So he says, It's no felon's gallows, but Holy Spirit's beheld him there, and men over the earth, and all this 
glorious creation. Now, we kind of think of gallows as being what? How, how are you executed via a gallows? You hang till you're dead. That's, that's not this kind of gallows. Okay? That word gallow, it's related to the word for neck or throat. Okay? So, wondrous was the victory tree. Hmm. Victory tree. The Old English is see ya, bam. And I was raised, excuse me, wondrous was the victory tree, and I was stained by sins. Notice the juxtaposition. It's the first time we really have one. Okay? The tree is wondrous. Me? Not so much. Stained by sins. Wounded with guilt positive phrase. It's kind of restating that subject. I saw the tree of glory. So before it was a victory tree. Now it's a tree of glory. Honored in garments, shining with joys, bedecked with gold. And the first day of class when I talked about the Viking invasions, where did the Vikings hit first? Monasteries and churches. Why? Because gospel books would be, having, would be covered in gold. They'd have a gold book cover. And the gold book cover would often have gems put in it. And crucifixes and crosses would be made of gold. And patents and dishes and chalices would be made of gold and silver. Why? Because the monks were rich? No, to honor the thing that they represent, that they point to. Okay. So he says, this tree was honored in garments. That is, somebody put this gold and these gems on it. Okay. Gems had covered worthily the creator's tree. It was worth being covered. And yet, the old English word that's used for beneath is through. It's modern English through. In the Middle Ages, excuse me, during the Middle English period, that gets flipped called metathesis. Okay? Chaucer in his Parliament of Fowls mentions the Threda Brida. Threda? T-H-R-I-D-D-E. Brida. B-R-I-D-D-E. He's talking about the third bird. The R-I becomes I-R. Modern English spelling. So, and yet, I'm going to use this. Through that gold, I began to see. Because beneath that gold implies what? I mean, it, it's kind of the same. That implies a super superimposition. The gold is on top of something else. And it's like the gold is being, for a moment, lifted back so he can see underneath. What else does beneath mean? Than underneath. I think there's more to it than that, though. And yet through that gold, I began to see an ancient wretched struggle when it first began to bleed on the right side. The ancient wretched struggle is Old English, Amra, Er win. Amra is the word that means wretched. We're going to leave that alone. But the Er win, Er battle. Struggle, conflict. If I said uh, Hawaii became a state ere I was born, what does that mean? Before. This is the before struggle. What's it really mean? The first. The proto struggle. The first struggle or battle or conflict. What's the first primary? Proto, human speaking, battle or struggle, conflict, sin, if you want. Garden of Eden, Adam, tree. Do I or do I not? Okay. Yes. So, in this whole thing, they don't. 
Yeah, Jesus, like, his name is not mentioned. But, like, the cross is representative of Jesus. Right? To an extent. We're going we're gonna to get to that. Jesus is not mentioned by the name Jesus. He's mentioned by Christ. And Christ is only used once. Uh, I think. Yeah. Might be used later on when the speaker is talking towards the end. But I don't think so. I think it's only in the one part, the thematic center of the poem, Christ was on the road. Christ was on the cross. Okay? The cross is going to, in a few lines after the cross starts speaking, the cross is going to identify with Christ. Okay? The cross is going to say, I suffered. Nails were driven through me. But he is going to say, I was drenched with blood from the man, not I produced the blood. Okay? And there's a reason for that. Yes? So, okay, so this is more about the cross and not Jesus. Yes. But it still references. Yes, very much so. Okay? Sorry. No, that's fine. Because, again, the title the translators and editors have given to it is The Dream of the Rude. And it's, it's the dreamer dreaming what the cross says to him. The cross is doing one thing, though. All, through everything the cross says, the cross is ultimately pointing to Christ. Okay? That's why it identifies with Christ. Just hold that in mind. I'm going to get to, maybe, this. And if you don't like church history, sorry, right now, um, I and a few others think it's central to this poem. Some, some of what's being discussed in with relation to these creeds, okay? So let's um, get to the end of the preface, so to speak. So he sees the gold, and then beneath the gold, he sees the struggle. When it first began to bleed on the right side. Why is the cross bleeding on the right side? And yet beneath that gold, I began to see an ancient wretched struggle when it first began to bleed on the right side. That's the side where Jesus was pierced by the centurion's spear. Okay? I was all beset with sorrows. The, the speaker, the dreamer, says this. Fearful for that fair vision. What's the fair vision? The cross drenched with blood on its right side. So why is he fearful? Put yourself in his shoes or in his bed. What the hell does this mean? Why am I seeing this? I saw that eager beacon change garments and colors. Now that kind of implies, you know, takes off one set of clothes and puts on another. It's not what it means. Think of like a holographic image. Like, you know, you can get those cards and you turn them one way. I could pull out my debit card and it's got a little, the chip on it is a hologram. If you move it, the little bird in the chip image looks like it's flying. The cross is doing the same kind of thing. At one moment, it's covered with gold and gems. At another moment, it's what? Dripping with blood. Now it was drenched, stained with blood, now bedecked with treasure. And the way some critics read that is the now and now, they're actually the same thing. There are a lot of old Protestant hymns that talk about the blood of Jesus as precious it's treasure what's one of the greatest myths in post christian that is after christ western culture king arthur and the holy grail what's the grail supposed to in the popular version of this which is entirely wrong by the way according to the myth the grail is supposed to be what a cup the old, the old French word, grail, from which grail comes from, it's a platter. Like you would serve meat on. Okay? Don't I, I have no idea how that became a cup. Anyways. Um, so, and yet lying there a long while. So this wasn't something, you know, just happened boom, instantaneously. I beheld in sorrow the Savior's tree. First time that's kind of mentioned other than the creators earlier, 
until I heard it utter a sound that best of woods began to speak words. The, the best wood there was. And the tree goes, it was long ago when I was a young sapling. What's the tree say? Notice what the tree, I never, I literally never thought of this before. What does the tree's opening words indicate? Louder? Keep going. The tree is speaking when? Now, present, and it does what? It relates the past. In other words, it's aware, as it were, now. Okay. It was so long ago, I remember it still, I was felled from the forest edge, ripped up from my roots. Sounds violent, because it is. Strong enemies seized me there. Is that the word I think it is? I don't remember. Now it isn't. I was hoping it was going to be the word havena, heathens, but it's not. That word often gets translated fiends. This word is feondas, strong fiends. F-I-E-N-D-S, modern English, comes from F-E-O-N-D-A-S. Strong fiends seized me there, he says, made me their spectacle, made me bear their criminals, what does the seized me, made me, made me imply about the cross? Excuse me, the tree before it becomes a cross. Keep going. Didn't want to do it. Right, slaves don't want to do what they're enslaved to do. They bore me on their shoulders, set me on a hill, and I, you know, I can't help but think, is that kind of a bit of a pun? They bore me on their shoulders. What's the cross going to do? Bear people on its shoulders. The axle beam or axle yaspana. Bore me on the shoulder, set me on a hill, enemies enough, fixed me fast. Then I saw, and we get a beginning of a passage that's going to emphasize two things about the person coming to the cross, about the person who will be put upon the cross. The two things are that that person is God and that person is man. Okay? Why? Okay, and it's the cross speaking. So assume for the purpose of the fiction of the creative world that the, creator, uh, that the dreamer creates or that the poet creates, that the cross is telling the truth as the cross knows it, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we're meant to, so to speak, believe it. Not believe like, you know, I believe in the cross and it's going to save me, that kind of thing, but believe its words. It's probably because, some of us think, it's probably because the speaker of the poem, excuse me, the, the poet and the dreamer want to make sure that everything he relates is doctrinally correct is orthodox in that sense. Orthodox meaning right teaching. It's, it, it follows the quote-unquote dogmas of the church. That is no possibility for heresy, okay? Well, central doctrine, classical, traditional, whatever you want to call it, Judeo-Christian theology is what about Jesus? Fully God, fully man. The whole point of the incarnation is that the God created the universe becomes a little baby Jewish boy. It grows up, crucified, etc. Okay? Fully God, fully man. If you say he's only fully man, that's heresy. If you say he's only fully God, that is, he appeared as a man, that's heresy. I was a old heresy called docetism, okay? Uh, if you said that he was God and man totally mixed up, okay? Everything's all intertwined. That's a heresy. It was fully God, fully man, but never <coughs> confused, co-fused together. In other words, it's a mystery. 
your the expression on your face is perfect because it's like, what? <laughs> How does that work? Whoosh. Over my pay grade. Over everyone's pay grade. It's a mystery. It cannot be logically understood. It's an article of faith, right? That's why it's part of, I've got this written down here, it's part of the creed. Creed comes from the Latin verb credo, I believe. It's not I know, right? I know each one of you is here right now. How do I know that? Stupid question, right? It's called an epistemology. How do you know what you know? Because I can see every one of you. And if I needed to, I won't. I could go and I could touch every one of you. And I could go and I could smell every one of you. And you could say something and I could hear every one of you. And I won't say the last sentence because that would just be even way too weird. Okay? Empirical understanding. <coughs> the creed has nothing to do with empirical understanding. It's an article of faith, okay? Which we're going to get to in a moment. So, he's beginning this section. Yes? So, the reason that he wants to be, like, so, like, in sync with the, what the Bible says or what the church is saying, does he, like, want this to be studied as a work of God? <sighs> See, now that's a tricky question. There are a variety of schools of thought or a variety of, of arguments as to what's the purpose of this poem. One of them is that it is meant to use to proselytize. That is, to reach out to heathens and to convince them. Heathen could just be Viking. We, we don't know when the poem is actually composed. If you look at the Wikipedia article, it, says that it suggests a date of 680. I don't think I've ever heard that date before. I don't know what its source is for that. We know part of it survives on the Ribble Cross. The Ribble Cross dates from about 700 AD. The runes on the cross could have been inscribed after the cross was created. They could have been. We don't know that they were. Most scholars assume that the runes coexist with the time that the cross was made. That the whole thing was created kind of at once, okay? So, which would make it around 700 AD. Well, even though that's before the Viking invasions, that's only about 100 years after the quote-unquote Christianization, <coughs> Roman Christianization, of the British Isles. There are still, we know, because of documents, you know, passages from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, there are still, quote unquote, holdouts to becoming Christian. People who still believe in Odin for the whole Germanic um, pantheon and such. Okay? So one argument is this is trying to be used to convince them of Christianity. Another argument is it might be employed to solidify the right understanding in the minds of nascent Christians, new um, converts to the faith, okay? who might have heard other forms of Christianity. In other words, heresies. They might have heard, no, 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 no. He's not God. He's not 100% fully God, which is why when we get to this, you know, the Nicene Creed begins with a statement about God, and then it immediately moves into Jesus, and the first several lines about Jesus are all about God, <laughs> fully God of fully God, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father, by whom all things were made, blah, 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 okay, I'm going to talk about all that, you know, maybe some of that in a moment, okay, so he's still setting this up, and notice, I introduced this, and we haven't gotten to what he actually says yet, okay? Bear in mind about the purposes of it. Horace, first century Roman poet, said, anybody know what he said about literature? 
what its purpose is? Twofold. It's to teach and delight. And Horace said, if it doesn't teach, then it's frivolous and useless. He would have hated television, you know, and TikTok and stupid games that while away your time and such. Okay? If it doesn't teach, it's pointless. But it has to delight too. If it doesn't delight, what does it become? What do my classes seem like? I should shouldn't say this because it's too too easy to answer. Often seem like they become homilies, you know, preaching like. Right? It's got to have both. There's a ton of Middle English literature that survives. Has this in spades? Has none of this? Ormulum, the Ormulum by a guy named Orm. Okay, I'm not kidding. 30, if I remember right, 30,000 lines of doctrine. It's just preaching. Boring. You want to kill yourself. For, oh, I don't know, 20 or 30. It's just 30,000. Okay? Um, Got to have the delightful aspect. Why? It sucks people in. It makes them go, yeah, this is good. And then you start thinking, about, oh, this is pretty deep. Oedipus, man. It's delightful in a weird, twisted, you know, masochistic sense, but it also teaches. So, Easily I might have felt all those enemies, yet fast I stood. What, what's the tree implying there? Spiritual conscience. Okay, what else? Yeah, the tree was conscious when it was raised as a cross. What else? What does it want to do? Easily I might have felled all those enemies. Oh, I could have wiped them all out. To me, it's the most enigmatic line of the entire poem. Because I just can't help but wonder, how? <laughs> how could the tree have done this? I mean, it's not like the tree's a Yoda or something. It's not like the tree's going to go, you know. How's the tree going to take out all of its enemies, the Roman soldiers who are doing the crucifying? It's, there's not just one or two. It's a whole bunch of them fall on them, you know, and then jump back up and fall on another one. How? I don't, I literally, I don't, if you have an answer, please, tell it to me. Well, I don't know many conscious trees. Well, okay, that's, <clears throat> see, now there are a lot of people who disagree with that. Okay. okay, well, yeah, I was about to say, like, you're wrong, because they, like, talk to each other. We do know that some trees are able to communicate of sorts. I'm not talking Treebeard and Tolkien and Lord of the Rings and Ints and stuff. Um, so, then I saw uh, the Lord of Mankind hasten eagerly. I dare not. And then he says, I saw the Lord of Mankind hasten eagerly when he wanted to ascend upon me. So, Lord of Mankind. Now, the Lord part is capitalized, it's not in the manuscript. So that could mean earthly lord, or it could be mankind, heavenly lord. Combining both. He does what? Hastened eagerly when he wanted to ascend on me. What does that imply? What's, how does the cross look at the coming Jesus? And I mean Jesus is walking towards him. He hastened eagerly. Is that Jesus going, oh, I'm going to die. This isn't going to be fun. Take this cup from me, God. No, this is, all right. Let's get ready. Let's go at it. I mean, this is what? This is what you want your Lord to be like. This is a Germanic chieftain. This is a young warrior getting ready to kick butt. And when he wanted to do what? To ascend upon me. It's like, no, 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 I don't want to die, I don't want to die. No, not that. 
It's like, would you put some steps up so I can climb up to that cross? I did not dare to break or bow down against the Lord's word when I saw the ends of the earth tremble. The ends of the earth tremble. Earthquake. That's crucifixion. Look in the Gospels. Did not dare to break or bow down. Again, what's the cross telling us? By telling us, I did not dare to do that. He's applying something. It is applying something about its mindset. Oh, but I wanted to. I wanted to. I wanted to break. Because you can't crucify someone on a broken cross. I guess you can nail them to it, but it's not going to do any good. I mean, yeah, they'll maybe eventually die from blood loss. but Or bow down. He couldn't do those two things. Why not? Germanic fourfold ethic. What's it begin with? Duty to one's Lord. What did he just say? Jesus wants to ascend on the cross. Question? Yep. I saw the Lord of mankind hasten eagerly when he wanted to descend. Ascend, I did not dare to break or bow down against the Lord's word. That kind of implies against his command. That's one way of reading that. What else can it mean? I, I think, I think an argument can be made for this. Might not be a great argument, but I think one can make a at least a half-assed argument for it. The Lord's word. Jesus is, what's another name for Jesus? Traditional Christian theology. The blank of God. The word of God. John begins the gospel. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was, there we go, was God, etc. Okay? He might be talking about the Lord's word coming closer and closer and closer to me. Okay? Might be. Not saying he is. Saying it. Might be a possible argument. Easily I might have felled all those enemies, yet fast I stood. Again, by saying what he might have done, that implies there's a wish there. Oh, I wish I could. And again, I'm left stumped. How, how could you have done this? Yet fast I stood. Then the young hero... Did I miss a part? No, it's going to come up. Then the young hero... Man, the old English word there, I think is line 38 or 39, is, yep, the young Haleth. Haleth. This word only means, doesn't mean only, means hero. It's the only context it's ever used. It doesn't mean boy. It doesn't mean man. It means hero. Then the young hero did what? Made ready. Okay. In the manuscript, there's no dash, M dash, statement, M dash. It just reads right along. The young hero made ready. That was God Almighty. Tick the man box, tick the God box. And not just the God box, but God in Old English is literally God Almighty. God, all, entirely, fully, completely mighty, full of power. Okay? So the poet makes very clear there who this is. Strong and resolute. Again, <clears throat> Germanic warrior. This is what you want. If you're a Germanic warrior, as your Lord. He ascended on the high gallows, brave in the sight of many, when he wanted to ransom mankind. So what is this young hero doing? Saving his people, right? Now, in some Anglo-Saxon poetry, 
And to a lot of Anglo-Saxon scholars, you know, what should a king never do? A smart king never does what? Himself. Goes into battle. Why? Yeah, what happens if he dies? Uh, problems can arise. So a smart king says, no, 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 you go. <laughs> and you and you and you go fight my battles. I'll give you reward, you know, the whole Germanic custom. He goes himself, okay, to ransom mankind, we're told. I trembled when he embraced me. And you're, the, the Wikipedia article mentions this interpretation or an interpretation of this line. When he embraced me, there's an entire, I know of at least one, I think there are two or three articles based on this half line, articles, like 15 to 20 pages that argue that what's happening here is an instance of erotic desire. One version, or homoerotic desire in another version, on the basis of this half line. And I read that, and I'll, I'll bring it up when I used to teach it to graduate students, I go, maybe one of you who understand this a lot better than me can explain this, because there is nothing in the poem other than the word implipte, Y-M-B-C-L-Y-P-T-E. Clipta just means clasped. Imb around. Clasped around. When he, where did the line go? When he embraced me. And it seems to me the only way you can get that kind of reading is to have your mind so fixed on sex that everything you read has something to do with sex. This has nothing to do with that. This is about the young warrior doing what? Embracing, okay, literally the cross, but what else? His fate. His fate, his purpose, his function. When he embraced me, but I dared not bow to the ground. Yes? Are those articles scholarly? Yeah. Yeah. One of them, if I, I could be, nah, I don't think this is true. There's an article, for example, leave this aside for a moment, um, about Bede. It's a pretty long article. About Bede's ecclesiastical history. How Bede's ecclesiastical, uh, the article I'm thinking about, talks about the Cadman section. And the article says, you know, the short changes women, it overlooks women, blah, 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 blah. blah. It's a big long, it's, it's like 20 pages. One of my students a few years ago, you know, um, did something that, that really bought into this. And I was like, um, did you look at the previous chapter book in Bede? The, the chapter that deals with Cadman comes after the entire chapter or book, it's variously called, that deals with Abbas Hild. The whole part previous to Cadman is about Hild and how her rulership of the monastery, her great rulership, all this, it's doing what? It's taking Hild out of the midst of history, so to speak, and going, what a model to be followed. And yet that scholarly article literally says nothing about Hild. Well, why? Because the chapter dealing with Cadman is, somebody finish my sentence, it's about Cadman. Why did J.K. Rowling write Harry Potter, the Harry Potter Anne novels, and not Hermione Granger and? Because they're not about Hermione. <laughs> they're about Harry. Different focus. That's it. It's not a, a slight, so to speak. Okay? So, again, I dared not bow to the ground. I had to stand fast. Why? Look at the next half line. I was reared as a cross. I raised up the mighty king, the Lord of heaven. Or the next two lines. I dared not lie down. 
The word for reared, even today, can have two meanings. We use a phrase to talk about children. What's the phrase? Two word? Child rearing. Child rearing. I was reared as a cross can mean the raising up, as in from its youth to now, or it can mean raised up as a cross. If it's the former, then what does that tell us? The cross is all, to use you know Protestant terminology, it's all part of God's plan of salvation. The, this tree was known from the beginning, take that back, from before time, that this tree was going to be the tree upon which Christ would be crucified. Here's something that'll blow your mind. Because it's not, this is not known generally today. Um, and, and I don't mean known as in you have to believe it kind of thing if you're a Christian. Not that. The, the idea is not known. The cross in the Middle Ages, it was widely believed that it came from what? Anybody know? A close tree of knowledge of good and evil. The cross was made from the wood of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was a commonplace idea. Okay? Where was the cross raised? What's the name of the place? Jerusalem. Outside Jerusalem. Has a specific name. One of the Gospels mentions it by name. I always find it very interesting because in the last Harry Potter novel, J.K. Rowling has Harry have a dream. And in this dream, he sees Voldemort do something, and it talks about a mountain that looks like a skull. Golgotha, which is the, where the crucifixion takes place, translates place of the skull. Well, the church interpreted that to mean that's where Adam was buried, and the cross is raised over Adam's grave. Why? Is the church now in the Middle Ages, this was widely believed. Um, can't say for Catholicism. I would say, you know, the Orthodox, I'm Ortho, Eastern Orthodox, like Russian Orthodox. I would say there's a, yeah, there's still in the tradition of the church this notion, because um, all the icons of both the crucifixion and the res resurrection have the cross. Well, the crucifixion definitely has a cross. And beneath the cross is this black like hole. And beneath that is a skull. Why? Because it's the place of the skull. That's usually interpreted as, that's Adam. Why? Because Jesus is called by Paul the second Adam. The whole life of Christ is, the, look, at, look the word up, the literal recapitulation of the life of Adam. So you have Adam and Eve, right? And you have Jesus and, she's going to be mentioned, Mary. Mary's the second Eve. Rather than leading Adam into sin, Mary gives birth to the one who will take away the sin. The whole, I mean, there's all kinds of parallels, okay? So, he embraced me. I dare not fall about uh, on the ground or fall to the earth's corners. I had to stand fast. I was reared as a cross. I raised up the mighty king. Here, Lord of Heavens, here. I dared not lie down. They drove dark nails. The same word is used. Thur, me. Well, previously that was defined as beneath. It can also, it, in other contexts, it gets translated in. Because who literally were the dark nails driven through? here and out here. They're not driven through the cross, per se. The scars are still visible, open wounds of hate. I dare not harm any of them. Notice, I dared, I dared, I dared, I dared. Not. The cross is telling us, I wanted to, but he can't. Why? Duty to Lord. Germanic fashion. I've got to obey my Lord. 
What happens when your Lord issues you a command that you know is not going to be good for your Lord? You got to follow him. You got to follow the Lord's command. We're going to see that problem with Beowulf. Beowulf's going to tell his men, you guys stay here. I'll go fight the dragon alone. Why? I'm a dragon killer. And most of the men go, cool. <laughs> okay, fine. You fight the dragon. But one of them, after bad things happen, says, no, no, no. We got to go stand with Beowulf. You know. uh, obey your Lord means obey your Lord. So they mocked us both together. Really? Go back and reread the Gospels. Where does anybody go, ah, you rotten piece of gopher wood, you know, you're a son of a fallen acorn or something. <laughs> they don't mock the cross. They mock those on the crosses. So what is he doing there that, I think it was you, mentioned? The cross is identifying with Christ. They mock both of us. What's the cross speaker, poet, possibly implying at? Or implying? Walk in my shoes, metaphorically, follow me, and you too will be mocked. Okay? I was all drenched with blood flowing from that man's side after he had sent forth his spirit. Last words. It is finished. Latin uh, Vulgate version of the Bible, consummatum est. Consummatum est doesn't mean, oh, it's done. Finally, I'm dead. The pain's gone. It means to consummate something means to complete it. It's perfected. I started, now I'm done. Okay? Yes? This is kind of a side note, but. Um so obviously we have Jesus' death in the Bible. Are there other records like recounting his death? Um, there's a guy named Flavius Josephus. Flavius Josephus. Can't say his name. Josephus. Josephus, who uh, first century Roman historian wrote a book called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. Big, massive. Um, actually, I'm thinking of a German translator who did this. Um, Joseph, Joseph, I don't know why I can't say it, Joe does, <laughs> um, and yeah, I believe, I mean, there are a few other references, not like the Gospels, though, not giving that full, um, full story, so to speak, okay? So, cross goes on. Much have I endured on that hill of hostile fates. I saw the God of hosts cruelly stretched out. Darkness had covered with its clouds the ruler's corpse, right? What happened after Jesus died? Darkness covered the earth, according to the gospel accounts. Darkness had covered with its clouds the ruler's corpse. How's that for a paradox? Okay, your translator, Leah's a tra capitalizes ruler. The old English there, if I remember right, is... Valdendes. Valdend means ruler, uh, means wielder. If you wild, you wield something, you control, you have the power or authority. So the ruler's corpse. Okay? That shining radiance, shadows spread gray into the clouds, all creation wept. We're getting to the thematic center of the poem. Mourned the king's fall. These, by the way, are some of the lines that are on the rebel cross. Christ was on the cross. Christ was on road. That's all it says for that next half, that half line. Christ was on the cross. Okay? And yet from afar, men came hastening to that noble one. I watched it all. Notice the cross doesn't die when Christ dies. I was all beset with sorrow, yet I sank into their hands, humbly, eagerly. That implies that the men who come from afar take the cross up out of the ground, lay it down flat, take Jesus off, and then because of what he's going to say later on, they put him back standing in the ground. Okay, pause for a second. How do you die by crucifixion? 
you suffocate. How do you suffocate? Why do you suffocate by crucifixion? Crosses were typically 10, 12, 14 feet tall. Four by four, six by six, usually fairly large timbers, like railroad um, ties. Six by six or so, okay? And the arm span was seven or eight feet, so that there'd be plenty of room on either side. So what you do is you get the person, you kneel them down when the cross is lying flat on the ground. But how do you get a 14 or a 10 or 12 foot beam of wood up, you know, that has an upright and then, you know, the crossbar, with somebody nailed to it into the ground? Well, you nail them near the hole. And you dig a deep enough hole so that when you lift it and it slides into the ground, it'll be more or less upright. It's not going to be perfectly upright. It's not like setting a, a post for a fence. Where you get a post hole digger, dig down, you have a nice hole, and it goes right in. you got to dig the hole wide enough so that, think of it like this. So here's your hole. You get your beam over here, and you start to lift it up. What's going to happen at some point right here? It's going to get up and up, and when it reaches about there, maybe, what's going to happen to the beam? Boom! Okay. And the hole's going to be three or four feet deep. Why? Because you want it to sit upright. If it's not deep enough, the cross is just going to fall back on the ground. So the person is not necessarily tied. According to the Gospel accounts, where does Jesus get the nails? He tells the Apostle Thomas, Put your finger through my hand. Through. He doesn't say in. He says, grip. Okay? So you're nailed like that, and then your feet are like this, and the nail goes through both ankles into the beam. So when that thing does this and then goes, boom, both shoulders dislocate. And you're, oh, oh, oh. plus it hurts like hell. <laughs> And your hands are torn. Thing is, you can live like that for days. You're getting just enough breath to breathe, but not enough to, because <gasps> implies your lungs go out because your shoulders are up. They're not dislocated, okay? You die through suffocation. So, they come to get the body. And we're told, Line 60, there they took Almighty God. That's definitely on the God side, right? Lifted him from his heavy torment. The warriors then left me standing, drenched in blood, all shot through with arrows. That's probably metaphorical. He doesn't mean, you know, they took the body down and then they went, hey, let's use this for target practice, you know, and start the arrows meaning the nails. They laid him down, bone weary, and stood by his body's head. Bone weary. Yeah, he's tired of his bones. They watched the Lord of heaven there, God's side, who rested a while, weary from his mighty battle. Don't go all Dan Brown on me and, you know, the, Jesus wasn't really dead. He later lived and went off and married Mary Magdalene and had children and all that kind of stuff. This is Lytotes. Okay. How weary was he from his mighty battle? <laughs> yeah. Miracle Max isn't going to bring him back with his big, you know, pill. For those of you who are Princess Bride fan. They began to build a tomb for him in the side of his slayer. Not in the gospel accounts. We do have the friends coming from afar. Joseph and Nicodemus. They go and ask Pilate for the body. Pilate says yes. They take him to not a tomb that they create, but to one that Joseph already has dug out. They lay him in the tomb. Okay. They begin to build the tomb, the side of the slayer. They carved it from bright stone. And they set within it the Lord of Victories. Really? How victorious? Germanic mentality. How victorious? They laid him in there. Dead. Paradox? Oh, yeah. And they sing a dirge. 
No, ver no mention of a dirge in the Gospels, but Germanic fashion, you would sing a dirge for your dead Lord. We're going to see that in Beowulf. Wretched at evening when they wished to travel hence, weary from the glorious Lord, he rested there with little company. Why did they want to leave quickly? Go back and read the gospel accounts. Why was only one disciple at the crucifixion? Because everybody else was afraid. Notice it's John who invites Peter to come into the trial scene. Why? Because John is friends. John knows the high priest. Okay? Go back and reread re -read that passage in the gospel. So, and we stood there weeping a long while, fixing our, who's the we? The cross and who else? Cross. Cross. The two other crosses. And maybe the dead guys hanging on the crosses. Okay. And they hear the song ascending, etc. The corpse grew cold, the fair life house. Meaning, man, spirits left. What's left? Bag of meat. <laughs> Sorry. Be crude. But, you know, pretty much it. Carcass. Then they began to fell us all to the earth, a terrible fate. They dug for us a deep pit. Not in the Gospels. We don't know what happened immediately to the crosses afterwards. And yet the Lord stains, friends found me there, adorned me with gold and silver. And cut and pick up with Elena. Because <laughs> Elena is all about the Lord's friends finding the cross. That's the link between those two works. Okay? Then notice what the cross does. Now, everything else was what? I remember when. It was all back at the time of the crucifixion. And shortly thereafter, the finding of the cross. Now, present tense, right now. You can hear, my dear hero, Who's the cross speaking to? The dreamer. The dreamer says, I was covered with sins. Guilty of sin. And the cross calls the dreamer a hero. That I have endured the work of evildoers, harsh sorrow, now the time has come far and wide. They honor me, that is, I was reared, raised as a cross, but now I'm honored. What did the speaker call the cross in the preface, the prologue, the brightest of beacons, the victory tree, the wondrous tree? Now the time has come far and wide. They honor me, men over the earth, and all this glorious creation, and pray to this sign. That is, prayers to the cross. Okay? That still happens. I don't know about the Catholic Church. It definitely still happens in the Orthodox Church. There are prayers that are said to the precious and life-giving cross, pray for us, praying for the cross to intercede. Okay. On me the Son of God suffered for a time, and so glorious now I rise up under the heavens and am able to heal each of those who is in awe of me. Notice, the cross doesn't say Jesus is, I am. Why? Because of that identification that we talked about. Once I was made into the worst of torments, most hateful of all people, before I opened the true way of life for speech. There's that word again, speech bearers. King of glory did what? Honored me over all the trees of the forest. He chose me. And then we get what? Just as he honored Mary over all women of the world. That first section where the cross speaks, that's like the first two major sections of where am I at? the Nicene Creed. Okay, so I need to back, I need to pause for a moment. 325 AD. Constantine the Great convenes a council of bishops. All right? It's called the first ecumenical council. Ecumenical means all the church of the world. It's for everyone in the church. Okay? He calls the bishops. He calls the bishops there to deal with one problem. It's, it's not because 
it's a problem for him. It's a problem that's risen to his level of hearing about, and he doesn't want problems in his world, meaning the Roman Empire at that point. Okay? The problem has to deal with a guy named, where is his name? A guy named Arius, the North African bishop, who started teaching an idea that is not agreed upon by everybody else. And the idea is, I'm going to use Arius' phrase, is this. There was a time when the Son of God was not. It's it, in a nutshell. Just that phrase. There was a time when the Son of God was not. Okay? That was condemned as a heresy. Because what does that imply? That the Son of God is not God. If you say the Son of God is God, and then you say this, there was a time when the Son of God was not, then you're saying there was a time when God was not. If you're saying there was a time when God was not, then God is not God. That's simple logic. If you define the word God as the highest that can be thought, St. Anselm the Great, or that beyond which you cannot think, you can't go behind, beyond God, all-powerful, all, you know, all those things, all the omni things, okay? So the way the church resolved this was they had a council. 318 bishops, I think it was, and Aries was condemned. It, it wasn't, you know, a lot of people think this was like Congress. No, we all get a vote. Kind of. It was unanimous, except for Arius. Okay? Arius des- delivered his position, and the council said no. And so what the council did is they came up with what's called the Nicene Creed, or the first part of it. The first part of it deal with two persons. Okay? Persons, not people. Person has a different meaning. The two persons are God the Father and God the Son. The third person is dealt with in the second part that is done at the next council, the Holy Spirit. Three persons of the Trinity, okay? So, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and indivisible. And, in the only begotten Son. So that's all that's said about God the Father. Next long passage is all about Jesus. And it's all about very God, very God, begotten, not made. Of one essence with the Father. These two words. Homoousios. Homo. One. Same. Usios. Essence. That's the word that's used in the creed. Arius said, nope, not one essence, not same essence. The difference between this word and this word is one letter. Homo e usios. This means similar in essence, like in essence. But if I say about somebody in class, I'll just pick somebody at random. You are like Albert Einstein. What does that mean? You're not. Notice, it's not a slam, because what does it mean? You're close, man. You're almost there. But it means you're not. If you're similar, in essence, What's the phrase? Close, but no cigar. I mean, you're not quite there. And they said, nope, not correct. Okay. Then, after the passage, or during the passage about Christ in the creed, begotten of the Holy Spirit, anybody know what comes next? And the Virgin Mary, and was made man, was crucified, dead, crucified under Pontius Pilate, Suffered, dead, and buried, third day rose again. So we've had Mary in the creed, we have Mary here, and then what's he gonna what does Christ next speak about? And he rose, and he's in heaven, and he's gonna come again. 
And what's he going to do when he comes again? Judge the living and the dead. That's how the passage about Christ in the Nicene Creed ends. And he will come again to judge the living and the dead. The next part in the Creed goes on to talk about the Holy Spirit. This doesn't talk about it. Why? Because I think, and there are a few other scholars that suggest this, the poet's interested or is emphasizing this part. Probably, probably not positive. Probably to correct some wrong thinking. Okay? Well, the first part of the Nicene Creed is in 325. The second part, I believe, is in 381. I'm pretty sure the Second Ecumenical Council, it's either in 381 or 350 something. Um, the Wikipedia article says this probably dates from around 680. I, I literally have no idea where they get that idea. What scholarly, I've read an awful lot of criticism on this. The cross, as I said, dates from around 700, so it's I mean, kind of close to 680. Um, but even if it's 700, you know, that's within 100 years or so of the Christianization, the Roman Christianization. There are, we know from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, there are pockets of areas within Anglo-Saxon Britain that haven't accepted Christianity and that still follow the Germanic pagan ways. Okay. Um, there's an English, there's a king named Radwald, but we'll talk about when we get to Beowulf. Within 75 years of this, and the guy sets up a pagan shrine next to a church. And he pray to Jesus and hail for. And he essentially says, I'm covering my bases, man. <laughs> I'm just... I'm going to make sure I'm cool with whoever. Not thinking, apparently. Thor's probably going, no. <laughs> going to get my hammer. And Jesus is going, no. <laughs> okay, we'll stop there. Uh, we'll finish Dream of the Root. Probably take us a little bit longer than I planned. Probably 20 minutes. Read all the stuff that, you, that is assigned for Beowulf. Okay, For the first day of Beowulf. I don't expect you to be like 1,200 lines into it because we probably won't get more than 20 or 30. Have a good weekend. Remember, um, quiz. Sunday night is when your quiz is due because you still need, if you haven't, to watch the video on Seafarer that 